She has a key. We are now live. Call the meeting to order. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to start off this morning by roll call. When I call your name, please answer present. Councillor McKenzie? Present. Uh, Councillor Partridge is absent today. Deputy Mayor Royale? Present. Councillor Strong? Present. And of course, Mayor Burton? Present. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interests? Uh, approval of the agenda. Recommendation? That the agenda for the regular meeting of council of October 13th, 2020 be approved as circulated. Someone move. Councilor McKenzie, second, uh, Councilor Strong. All in favor? It's carried. Uh, minutes? The council for the municipality of Highlands East approves the minutes of the regular council meeting of September 22nd, 2020. Someone move. Councillor Strong, second Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Council, this morning we have a, a couple, uh, uh, two delegations actually, and uh, Martin Wildberger, construction on your land. Welcome. Hi, this is Martin. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay, so I'll share uh, my screen and uh, that way we'll have. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. All right. So I'd like to thank the Reeve and the council for the opportunity to address this group and provide facts to the noise complaints raised in the September 22nd council meeting by the delegation of Jeff Peters and Joe Lipset against the building taking place at 1131 Abrams Road. As I have limited time, I will focus my comments on the build at 1131 Abrams in support of the recommendation put forward by the chief building officer to extend my construction agreement. It is important to note that Potash Lake is a huge part of my life and my family's. I personally have been on the lake since 1961 and my family since 1960. Our family cottage was always a favorite destination. My wife and I bought our first cottage shortly after we married 32 years ago. My 93 year old father, who still joins me every week up at 1131 Abrams, purchased the property in 1988 and my wife and I purchased it from my father and mother nine years ago. It has always been our dream to build a beautiful place on 1131 Abrams Road and see it completed with my father. 1131 Abrams is a very unique property on Potash Lake. And while beautiful has come with huge challenges making this not a typical build. Some known before the build started, some discovered along the way. The property is roughly eight acres of land with over 3000 feet of shoreline, as you can see in the aerial shot dated August 17th, 2020. The first major task related to the construction project was the building of a road through the property to the construction site. This is roughly 600 feet long and was built from July 17th to November 17th. In July 30th, 2018, with the approval of the building permit, we were finally in a position to begin the site excavation. The week of August 7th, a professional team of rock excavators came on site and blasted out the rock basement for one week. From mid-August 2018 to May 2019, over 200 loads of solid granite stone was removed from the construction site. These photos hopefully give you a snapshot into the massive work and why it took months and is far from a typical build. The rock was moved to two major piles of rock on the property and when they were full, the rest was moved to my property across the bay. During this period, some asked why I didn't hire more trucks to move the rock faster. I contacted three separate lo local tandem truck haulage companies and each indicated that since the site was basically all rock and no dirt, they would not be willing to move the rock since the rock would destroy their dump trucks. This left me with no alternative but to remove the rock using a dump truck I purchased for the job. 
The footings for the build was finally poured on June 16th, 11 months after the building permit was granted. And on July 12th, the first massive load of lumber arrived. The construction crew of five worked 12 hour days, four days a week from Monday to Thursday. Everything on this build has been more complicated than originally planned. The size of the concrete pour meant that a concrete pumper truck had to be on site four separate times. The fact that the excavation was solid rock meant that the backfilling was not a simple task of just moving piles of excavated material back into the hole, but rather 30 tandem loads of fill were required. The roof trusses were so complicated that it took a seasoned team of contractors over three weeks to just install the trusses using heavy machinery. The windows arrived in mid-November, just in time to make the building winter tight. The exterior stonework started in late May of 2020 and originally was estimated at taking six to eight months. As of today, they are approximately 55 to 60% done with the most complicated sections completed. The plan is to work as long into the fall as possible and then start back up in the spring of 2021. In parallel to the outside work, we have completed the most of the plumbing, heating, and are now into the wiring. Another example of the complexity of this project was the hydro. This plan was to, the plan was to run an underground wire from the road up to the new building site. This meant that a high voltage transformer pad was required by hydro standards and that the line would be required to be buried four feet. This required a trench to be dug over 700 feet long and for over 150 feet, it required that we go through three feet of solid rock. The transformer pad then needed to be completely buried, which required another significant load of fill to properly submerge the wires since you can't fill the trenches with the rock removed since you need clean fill. It is important to stress that I am very aware of the noise and disruption that this construction project has caused for neighboring cottages. Construction is generally difficult and can be put a strain on neighbor relations. I fully understand the frustration but I think the criticism voiced in previous presentations to council is not only inaccurate, but unfair. The project is big, it is complicated. And when we started this project, there was no such thing as COVID-19. The exterior stonework, which is one of the most significant complaints of obnoxious noise, was planned and scheduled specifically to take place only from Monday to Thursday, solely so it would minimize the disruption on the weekends. It's unfortunate that COVID hit and people moved to their cottages throughout the summer of 2020. A second major complaint has been my use of my 14 ton Cabelco excavator and my case skid steer. In the September 22nd council meeting, Mr. Jeff Peters stated, quote, noise generated over the years include the excruciating sounds of metal claws of the excavator as it scrapes dirt off stone or is grappling with large rocks, the crashing sounds of the rock as they are heaved into the metal bed of the drum truck or onto rock piles, unquote. The report and the stories around this construction project makes it sound as if these heavy equipment machines are in constant use and there is never a piece of quiet to be had. And I know if I state that the machines are always used inside the bylaw hours, that I try to minimize the usage to only essential jobs, and that the majority of time throughout the summer these machines are sitting idle, people would say this is untrue and that the machine is in constant use. The skid steer, which Mr. Jeff Peters refers to as a bobcat-like machine, is critical on this project as a machine like this is needed to unload the over 48 pallets of four tons of rock facing that have been delivered. Each four ton pallet is first unloaded at the bottom of the hill, and then every weekend, two or three are moved up to the construction site for the week's supply. The excavator has been used throughout the construction project, first in the rock excavation, the placement of huge steel beams, the backfilling of the site, the removal of excess rock, and most recently in the digging of the 700 foot trench required by Hydro. But while people would complain these machines are in constant youth, data will show the truth. You see, one of the beautiful things about this great machine is that it is completely connected to a satellite monitoring system every second it is on. From the Cabelco head office, I can retrieve everything from gas mileage to CO2 emissions, and for this presentation, the all important monthly usage report. For the entire three years I have owned this machine, the data on figures 16, 17, and 18 show the monthly usage for 2018, 2019, and 2020. 
In the entire three years, this machine has been turned on for 154 hours, 69 hours in 2018, 37 hours in 2019, and 45 hours in 2020. If we study the most recent year of 2020, one can see the monthly usage report. For the entire month of June, it was used for five hours and 53 months, the entire month. For the entire month of July, six hours and 33 minutes, and for the entire month of August, five hours and 44 minutes. These hours include the time for traveling and idle, which is the warm up speed. And as you can see in the chart, the digging hours, which is what makes noise, is significantly less, four hours, 4.5 hours, and 3.8 hours. It is important to highlight that this is the only machine I can that I have that can lift the rocks, load the dump truck, and dig the hydro trenches. In the letter submitted, Mr. Jeff Peter states, quote, he claims that if a neighbor asks him to stop what he is doing, he stops. He further adds that, quote, however, that has not been our predominant experience, unquote. I find this very sad. First, it's important to point out that I have never met Joe Lipset or talked to him. I've only met and talked to Mr. Jeff Peters once. My first and only encounter with Mr. Jeff Peters took place on Friday in August of this year at 11.30 a.m. when I was digging the hydro trench. In response, he was yelling at me from his dock, calling me all kinds of choice swear words. In response, I asked him to come over and have a civilized conversation. Five minutes later, I explained to him that I am digging this trench according to the hydro specifications. I explained to him that I'm doing it on a Friday at 11.30 so I can minimize the impact on the weekend. I asked him if what I was doing warranted his swearing and if he had any suggestions. I also pointed out how disappointing it was that this was how he chose to introduce himself to me. I tried to impress upon him that I am well aware of the noise concerns, but I'm trying to minimize the disruption. But unless he has any constructive suggestions, his complaints are not fruitful. It is important to note that in the nine years I've owned 1131 Abrams, this construction project has been going on for three years, not the seven they like to quote, including projects like building the volleyball court or the day-to-day -day maintenance of the eight acre forest is inaccurate and unfair. And since I own four properties within a hundred yards of each other, comprising of over 23 acres of forest, the sound of chainsaws, four by fours moving brush is a necessary activity to properly maintain the forest. I acknowledge that the stone cutting has been difficult, but we try to minimize it by doing it only from Monday to Thursday. The excavation was a pain, but it was unavoidable and largely complete. The underground hydro was a pain, but it has been completed. I'm trying to be transparent with this project and to date the following suggestions have come my way. One, when the front stone wall is complete, switch to siding for the rest of the building. This is almost insulting. Two, cut the stone off premises and install on site. This is totally unfeasible. Three, stop stoning the months of June, July, and August. This is unfortunately not only cost prohibitive, would drag the project into multiple more years, but would be totally unacceptable to the stoning crew who cannot schedule their work that way. Four, this is in addition to, why did you have to build it on the point why can't you build something smaller? And why did you have to build it out of natural stone? Going forward, COVID continues to disrupt this project. The solarium portion of the build remains completely on hold until the stonework is completed. And while targeted for next summer construction, the glass window manufacturer has indicated that their plant operations is still being disrupted by COVID. By the end of this year, the Masons believe that 60% of the exterior will be completed and the crew has committed to start up as quickly as possible in the spring of 2021. The complaint says I have only two masons. In truth, I've always had three and for much of the summer four. Adding more is not feasible as the masons are very concerned with COVID and the three current workers all live together and work together. I'm trying to complete this project as quickly as possible. I'm very much motivated to complete this while my father can participate with me. In the August council meeting, the application for the building agreement extension was deferred to investigate the complaints. Both the building and bylaw departments have investigated the complaints and I have personally met with the County of Halliburton, 
the Crow Valley Conservation Authority, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, and the Ministry of Labor. As the Chief Building Office Official wrote in her letter of September 22nd, these agencies conducted their own investigations, spoke to the homeowner, and ensured that compliance with their regulations were being met. Since the Potash Lake Conservation Association president used in his argument, quote, have you ever heard of the Ministry of Labor being called in, unquote, I thought this warranted additional data. The Ministry of Labor was called by one of my neighbors claiming that I, I quote from the official reports, quote, complaint regarding lack of respiratory protection while cutting stone, unquote. Upon a site visit, the Ministry of Labor Health and Safety Division officer, officer clearly reported that, quote, workers were observed wearing respiratory protection on site, unquote. In their letter, they complain about the use of a wood chipper. As you all know, the beginning of this summer presented an enormous challenge on our emergency response providers. As a result, a total fire ban was put in place. This presented another challenge for the project as the underground hydro and septic would require a number of large trees to be removed. I didn't want a pile of trees piled on the property, so I purchased a wood chipper and have used it three times on the 1131 Abrams property. If I would have hired a professional woodcutter service, they would have done it not any faster or any quieter. Our key requirement of the building agreement is that I tear down the existing building. I have made it clear that I will do so upon the completion of my building. It's important to note that no one has slept in that building in eight years. Today, my father and I use the building for main re four main reasons. One, until the hydro went into earlier this month, it served as a source of electricity. Two, it continues to this day to serve as a source of water. Hoses run from the existing building up to the construction site and without water, this project would be only slower. Three, it serves as a washroom for the construction workers. And four, and most importantly, it serves as a huge garage. All my power tools and equipment are stored there. Causing me to tear it down now and not after the project would only further slow down the project. As I close with an acknowledgement of the noise this construction project has caused, but I trust this council recognizes the enormity of the task and the enormity of the challenge to undertake such a project in COVID-19. The good news is that most of the noise is behind us, but unfortunately the build is not done. So I don't want to mislead anyone that there will not be more noise. I can commit as I have done to date that all work will be done according to the bylaws in place. My concern is that beyond disrupting the progress, two of my neighbors have threatened that they will continually escalate and explore all avenues to stop this project. I do wish to have on record that the antics to try to shut down the project have become tiresome and is mean spirited. The complaint stated I was relentless. I'd like to think that relentless means hardworking and hopefully there is no bylaw against being hardworking. Thank you for the time you have provided me today. Abrams Road, which has construction taking place. Someone move, please. Councilor McKenzie, second. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Our next delegation councils Diane Kennedy, ensuring a better future for Highlands East. Welcome, Diane. Hello, may I share my screen? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Are you able to see the slide? Not yet. Diane, your video's not on. Ah, that should do it. Let me share you. the screen.
How is this? Do you, do you see the? Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Highlands East has a vision to maintain or improve the environment and water quality in the municipality and welcome new residents and recreational vehicle visitors to share and appreciate the natural setting and character of the community. You should be commended for this excellent plan. The plan has principles like land uses in proximity to the shoreline area of inland lakes and rivers. These will be regulated in an effort to minimize impacts upon lake water quality and to protect shoreline and riparian areas from degradation. And land use designations, including new development in the shoreline shall be sensitive to the preservation of existing tree cover and vegetation so as to prevent erosion, siltation, and possible nutrient migration and help maintain wildlife habitat. Furthermore, the type of development permitted to encroach within the buffer shall be administered through site plan control. Land use designations also speak to shoreline natural area design and tree preservation with multiple good guidances. Indeed, the existing shoreline tree preservation bylaw limits tree cutting to within 30 meters of a water course. So do the bylaws ensure that this, won't become this. The limits of shoreline development clearly state that the intent of the plan is that new development in the shoreline designation be directed to lands that are physically suitable for development in their natural state. We are addressing council today to clarify as cottage owners, what can we expect from Highlands East and present suggestions on how we can help with regards to implementation of the plan, the enforcement of bylaws by the various governing bodies, the consistent enforcement of bylaws. It is our belief that all cottages, cottage owners should be required to comply with all bylaws. The creation of new bylaws that address construction, obnoxious soil, and the endless reshaping of the landscape. Let's provide a few examples to flesh out why we need the attention of and action from council. Example one, project management. It has been stated by Mr. Wildberger that, I own four properties within 100 yards of each other comprising over 23 acres of forest. Mr. Wildberger couldn't have better described the magnitude of his projects. A complicated labor and resource intensive new cottage build, roads and landscaping along the shorelines, extensive blasting and rock removal for site preparation, a 700 foot trench for buried hydro. The projects are being managed by Mr. Wildberger. Does he have the necessary background to undertake projects of this magnitude? Does he share the vision of Highlands East? Does he have the requisite knowledge of the bylaws and, re and requirements? Does he have the same requirement to adhere to rules and regulations as would professional landscapers, excavators, etc., whose company and profession are placed in jeopardy if they fail to do so? A major risk to Potash Lake is being played out before our very eyes. Joe Bay is a special part of the lake that has been declared at capacity and as such special consideration is required by law when building permits are issued. Mr. Wildberger's presentation clearly lays out for council members the enormous impact the construction and landscaping has had on the environment and the community. It is a perfect example of what can happen when building permits are granted without a fulsome analysis and oversight of the impact it will have on the environment and the community. We recommend that Highlands East look more deeply before issuing permits. It is Highlands East's ultimate responsibility to protect all and everyone concerned. Example two, sustainability of development. To quote from Mr. Wahlberger, from mid-August 2018 to May 2019, over 200 loads of solid granite stone was removed from the construction site. This hopefully gives you a snapshot into the massive work and why it took months and is far from a typical build. The rock was moved to two major piles of rock on the property and when they were full, the rest was moved to my property across the bay." End quote. Moving rocks to another property seems to be a clear violation of the Aggregate Resources Act. 
why was he allowed to do this? Why did he need to do this given that he had an eight acre lot? Who is monitoring the activity? Why isn't Highlands East making sure that the appropriate governing body is addressing the issue properly? Who is responsible for making sure that this activity doesn't happen in the future? Regarding development of private roads, new private roads will not be permitted, the development of new private roads will not be permitted unless such a private road is developed as part of a plan of condominium or resort. Like this. Example number three, to quote Mr. Wahlberger, the first major task related to the current construction project was the building of a road through the property to the construction site. This is roughly 600 feet long and was built from July of 2017 to November of 2017. Here's a snapshot illustrating part of a road built leading down to the shoreline at 1131 Abrams Road. This road actually doesn't lead to the house site. It's a road to nowhere. It looks like it was built with the express purpose of exposing the rock and taking down trees. Does this fall under the purview of Crow Valley, Ministry of Natural Resources? How does the municipality of Highlands East ensure that the appropriate governing body, body is enforcing their plan through bylaw? Or why is a permit not required for this type of activity when this is exactly the type of work that is clearly destru destructive? In accordance with the plan regarding natural environment and the lake, council will respect the environment and will follow the principle of sustainability and will consider the cumulative impacts of planning decisions. Here's what Fisheries and Oceans Canada recommends when designing for good lakeside living. It is a succinct summary of good practice along the shore and along the littoral zone. Example number four, Mr. Wahlberger states, including projects like building the volleyball court or the day-to-day -day maintenance of the eight acre forest is inaccurate and unfair. And since I own four properties within a hundred yards of each other, each comprising over each other, comprising over 23 acres of forest, the sound of chainsaws, four by fours moving brush is necessary activity to properly maintain the forest. You can't turn a wetland into a volleyball court and the forests have been growing and self-managing for hundreds of years. Why is it necessary to maintain the forest as he suggests? The shoreline tree preservation bylaw governing the removal of trees on shoreline properties in the county of Halliburton has been violated. And what about persistent landscaping? Example number five. Mr. Wildberger wishes council, and I quote, to support the recommendation put far by the chief building officer to extend my construction agreement. The landscaping construction activities and associated noise at Abrams Road, Tiger Lily Lane, and associated backlots have been going on for far too many years, as evidenced by, one, the submission made by Mr. Joel Lipset and Mr. Jeff Peters at the, 20, at the September 22nd Highlands East Council meeting. Two, supported by a significant portion of the 375 plus signatures at the change.org save the shoreline of Potash Lake petition. And three, the many, many emails and letters sent to the councillors and to Highlands East. Mr. Wellberg also says, it's unfortunate that COVID hit and people moved to their cottages during the summer of 2020. It is galling to presume that his construction and landscaping activity are limited to Monday and th to Thursday. Perhaps the stonemasons are, but when they are gone, Mr. Wahlberger starts up. He mentioned in his address to council the hours of use of the Cobelco excavator. He did not provide information about the Case TV 380 skid steer, the John Deere 310 SJ backhoe, the dump truck, the ATV, the Genie S40 boom lift, the equipment float, and the Red Kaboka excavator. All of these machines produce obnoxious noise with beeping, track noise, rock grating, diesel engine revving, etc. What property, what cottage property could possibly require such an arsenal of equipment for normal cottage life? Mr. Wahlberger continues to underemphasize the impact he has had over a number of years on this lake and most recently this bay.
Obnoxious uses is defined to be a use which, from its nature or operation, creates a nuisance or is liable to become a nuisance or offensive by the creation of noise, vibration, or by reason of gas fumes, dust, etc. Example number six, the obnoxious noise must be addressed. While the actual construction of the new cottage may arguably have started in 2017, it has already been extended by a summer past the construction agreement. The landscaping noise has been going on for much, much longer, and we're certain it will continue indefinitely. Mr. Wahlberger enjoys doing this type of work himself. It's primarily done during the weekends, evenings, and summers. It is not done by licensed contractors who have a team and get the work done during a normal work day in a fraction of the calendar time. How much more should neighbors have to put up with? In summary, how much is too much? Is it reasonable for residents to have to put up with construction of obnoxious noise forever? The mega mansion build has been going on since 2017 already. Mr. Wahlberger has requested another two year extension, which will bring the project to six plus years. And there is valid concern by the neighbors that he won't stop here. The landscape transformation with heavy equipment is a hobby that we will believe will continue over multiple properties. Additionally, the last two years that we have just endured were granted by a special bylaw, 2018-63, that was created just for Mr. Wahlberger to complete the project by 2020 with special privileges granted. What do we want? We do want Mr. Wahlberger to complete the construction of his new cottage, it, but it needs to be completed. It needs to be done by the end of 2021 with Nova Heavy construction between June 1st and September 6th, 2021. The blackout period is a must have for neighbors. We also encourage the township to take aerial views over all of Mr. Wahlberger's properties and enforce any further heavy landscape beyond December 31st, 2021. We believe this will be a prudent step which will avoid the need for future, future escalations to council. The CN Tower was built in 40 months at five days a week. The Taj Mahal took 17 years in the 1600s. However, it was done using elephants, stones cut by hand, and no noise from heavy equipment. Sadly, on Joe Bay, we have the worst of both worlds, a mega cottage being built with the dry cutting of every stone by noisy saws and endless landscaping by the owner using noisy heavy equipment. As my 93-year-old father-in-law, who has a cottage on this lake since 1968, said in his email to the mayor and councillors for Highlands East, my cottage is at 1077 Abrams Road and is a directly across the bay from 1131 Abrams Road. It's maybe 500 feet from Mr. Wahlberger's property. The noise from the construction of the cottage and in particular the operation of heavy equipment for landscaping purposes is relentless. Rather than being at cross purposes, we want to work with council and Highlands East towards a solution. We want to learn from this experience and use the knowledge for prevention rather than problem rectification. Addressing the issues raised by Mr. Wahlberger's projects will help council set very important and valuable precedents for responsible development of future builds and landscaping. It will ensure that all future landscaping and construction meets the required bylaws and that they are completed in a reasonable time frame. We want to ensure a better future for Potash Lake Highlands East. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. You're welcome. Um, resolution? That council receives the delegation as presented by Diane Kennedy. Do I have someone move? Councilor Strong, second. Councilor Ryle. I'm just waiting for the screen for a second here. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Okay, Council, we're uh, down to department reports, uh, building, Laurie. Good morning, Mayor and, and Council. 
I hope everybody enjoyed a uh, happy Thanksgiving. I know I did, and I certainly enjoyed that new baby. So building uh, report. I don't, uh, I don't know if you have the, the screen or not. However, um, building permits issued to date is um, 135 with 15 new dwellings and 120 other projects. So not quite as many as last year, but we are closing the gap and we do have more dwellings this year than, than last year by one. Uh, many more uh, building permits are uh, being issued, so we continue to be quite busy with the uh, with those, those projects. Um, number of zoning compliance letters, and so um, septic sewage system permits to date are up quite a bit from up seventy one from sixty four last year and uh, quite a few reports, installation reports that have been, uh, been done. Lots of inspections going forward and uh, we are still having some bylaw infractions that we're dealing with and um, a number of planning applications that are, are coming forward that I have helped people with uh, filling up the applications. And you can see our finances at the uh, at the bottom. And that is my building report. Thank you, Lori. Any questions for Lori? Cease. Lori, do we know if there's going to be enough time? Like you were talking about new new uh, permits being coming in all the time. Do you think, or do you have any idea uh, as to whether or not there'll be enough in the remainder of the year? to catch us up to the number, the financial number that we had last year, or we're gonna fall a little short, which, which wouldn't surprise me, I'm just asking. Yeah, we, we may fall a little short um, simply because of, of COVID and not, um, you know, we, we were still taking in uh, the, the projects and have issued a number of permits, but what people are finding right now is the cost is getting to be quite high and the availability of materials. So a lot of people who uh, were going to be doing permits have said, you know what, I think maybe we'll just wait and do it next year. They, they can't get pressure treated. The, the cost for the materials is just becoming prohibitive. So um, we, we may not have as many permits issued as, as we did last year, but we'll, we'll see. You know, th this time of year gets to be extremely busy with a lot of projects coming in so that they can get started before the, the snow flies. So I, I, I can relate to that. I can relate to that. I know I bought a piece of uh, half inch plywood in, uh, in February and I paid $26 for it. And I bought a piece uh, yesterday and it paid $46 for it. So yeah. if you're buying lots of it, it's going to reduce, it's going to increase price significantly. Yes. That. Other questions for Lori? Recommendation? That council receives a monthly report for the building department as information <laughs> only as submitted by the chief building official. Someone move. Councillor McKenzie, second Councillor Strong. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, septic inspection report, Arlene. So I'm going to uh, do Arlene's report. She's doing some inspections this morning. Okay, so uh, as usual, we, we have the uh, the tables for each lake, and um, you know she's making good progress on the properties, and um, sending out letters, and doing some some orders. So with the, the table, you can see some of the ones that she's been able to get resolved. One on Koshlong, Glamour, Billings, and um, two on Goodrum Lake. And there, those are the, the high risk ones. And there was also one that was considered moderate on uh, Essen Creek. So she has some of the orders that, that she was posting 
the one was on Billings Lake that has now been resolved. And one of the ones on Goodrum Lake has been resolved. And she has posted orders on Glamour, Little Glamour and Salerno. She also had two new septics that were installed under the program and uh, one on Billings Lake and, and one on Essen Lake. And we have received one new septic application in September under the program. And so new applications are not included in the resolved until it is uh, deemed complete. So we do have more that uh, um, our clients are working on, but they are still in progress and will probably be completed and on next month's report. Thank you. Questions? Cease? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. And the comment is, thank you. Um, we have been, uh, well, I've been getting a lot of uh, conversation, for a better word, with the uh, lakes that were uh, inspected later or earlier, that is in 2017 and, and in that area. And the fact that we're now really working on those guys and getting them done, in addition to the triage, which you explained to us in the last I think it's it's now going to put much more credibility into our program, and, and I look forward to your report in uh, next month to uh, to let us know where we are. So again, thank you. Oh, you're you're welcome. It's uh, it's been challenging and uh, far more work than than I anticipated, especially when the students can go out and do you know 800 properties in in a year. It becomes a bit overwhelming. So. It's uh, wonderful to, uh, to have Arlene and um, she's been really working hard on, on getting compliance with, with people. And some have been easy and some have had to have orders posted because they don't seem to wanna to comply for whatever reason. So, but we are making progress and um, we will continue to plug away. Thank you. <clears throat> Recommendation. The council receives a progress report on properties inspected in 2017, 2018, and 2019 as information only as submitted by the septic inspector. Someone move. Councillor Strong, second Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. <clears throat> okay, bylaw. Kristen. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Uh, so good morning, Mayor Burton and members of council. Uh, as you have before you, it will be the monthly bylaw report. Um, we continue to uh, you know, see increased number of um, calls and complaints. Uh, we're working through them as best we can. Um, you'll see some resolved, um, some being postponed or uh, diary dated so we can go back for inspection. Um, again, uh, you know, number one is voluntary compliance. We're really pushing towards that. Um, and just trying to work through all the strain that COVID has placed, uh, not only on others, um, but sort of everything surrounding uh, basically uh, everyone's day to day for the most part. Um, if you have any questions, I mean, we're, we're here to answer, but uh, as you can see, there's definitely lots going on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, questions? Resolution? The council receives a monthly report for the bylaw department as information only as submitted by the bylaw enforcement officer. Uh, someone move. Councillor McKenzie, second by Councillor Strong. All in favor? Carrie, thank you. Uh, the draft off road vehicle bylaw, Kristen. So I have prepared a report um, and as was requested of the bylaw department, we prepared a uh, uh, draft bylaw. Um, basically, uh, County Council passed a bylaw in their last meeting um, 
to permit um, the new vehicles on the uh, roads. However, in saying that again, just to clarify, it doesn't mean that they're allowed on the roadway or the traveled portion. Um, it would just be allowed onto the shoulder and where they cannot continue onto the shoulder, they're allowed to encroach onto the roadway temporarily. So I did enclose, include that in the staff report, uh, but basically for the most part, this bylaw mimics the county's bylaw and just would allow the new off-road vehicles to be permitted onto municipal, municipally maintained roads. Um, I didn't go into uh, any prohibitions or exclusions. Um, some bylaws go into very detailed um, areas of, of exclusions. Um, but again, this was sort of the first go around uh, and again, mimicked the county's bylaw to try to uh, maintain consistency throughout. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions? Uh, Councillor McKenzie? I'm, uh, I, I read through that. I take an interest in, in this kind of thing. Uh, so any uh, uh, off-road vehicle, including what I refer to as dirt bikes, is there a requirement that they be licensed and insured before they can be used on any road? That's part of the, um, uh, the regulation uh, from the province. So that wouldn't be anything that we would touch on. Basically what we're saying is they would be permitted so long as they meet. Um, so I believe that is discussed in, let me just confirm here. Um, that would be in the 316, OREG 31603 and part of the Highway Traffic Act. Cam, go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, I, I did see that there and I kind of assumed that uh, that's what it said and uh, maybe I was a little bit lazy to <laughs> to not look it up but uh, that that's good that they they, they require license and yeah and that would be enforced by the OPP in our area that's not something that we have any authority to stop anyone um, we can't request that information so again basically what this bylaw does is this bylaw permits uh, either permits or denies and it's a requirement underneath the provincial legislation and therefore if we permit um, then the OPP would be the ones to enforce. Um, and again, if we were to deny, it would be the same thing, um, but they have to meet all the uh, sections and regulations, um, just like anything else. I understand, thank you. Deputy Mayor Ryle. Uh, probably, you know, a different thing. I get two questions. One, I'm assuming for the sake of argument that snowmobiles are covered off in a different area because they are off-road, but obviously they don't have wheels. So uh, that's a separate issue. It is. Snowmobiles would not be considered a, an off-road vehicle under this legislation. So, so is there a bylaw somewhere or is that covered by the uh, MTO? Um, so uh, there's the, I can't remember the act exactly, but motorized, there's... Motorized Snow Vehicle Act. Yeah. So there is a motorized snow vehicle act and that's again by the province. Um, and again, that would be something if, if municipality of Highlands East wanted to permit or deny uh, snowmobiles, they would have to uh, create a bylaw. Um, but at this point uh, they would be permitted on the trails. And um, you know, that again, that's nothing that we can enforce. It's provincial, so OPP would enforce it. But yes, we would have to have something separate if we want to regulate snow snowmobiles or, or off-road. Um, Second question, Steve. Yeah, the other one was related to the speed limits and uh, I can understand the maximum speed limit being 50, which makes perfect sense to me uh, regardless because most of the vehicles can't handle more than that. My concern is enforcement of the, uh, where we're talking about where the speed limit is 50 and it's gonna be uh, reduced to 20. Uh, there's an awful lot of high powered machines and uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying that the bylaw is wrong or it should be changed. I'm more concerned about how that's going to get enforced because 20 kilometers an hour is is uh, going to be fairly low in a 50 kilometer zone. Uh, I understand the rationale why, but how do we plan on enforcing that effectively? So that's already written in the legislation that was just sort of carried over more as a, I want to say a reminder, but um, you know, that's already in the act, OREG 31603 uh, already basically stipulates that. So um, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're not, um, you know, saying that we're going out to enforce it. That's already the provincial legislation. We're just incorporating it in there as well. Um, and again, I just took that off of the counties and it doesn't necessarily have to be in there because it's something that as a um, uh, 
um, an off-road vehicle rider or um, driver, they have to be aware of those, those speed limits anyway. That's from the province. Um, so that's something that could be um, removed and, um, you know, or included either way. It's, it's still legislation that has to be followed regardless. I guess my question would be, is that something that would be enforced by OPP? Because I can't see you guys being able to enforce that. Yes, we, we can't. We're not deemed officers in that in that regard to stop or um, have them produce identification or, um, you know, basically to, we, we don't have the authority to stop that vehicle. Uh, so if there was a complaint, all we could do is, is gather the information and, and follow up with the registration number, identification of the, the driver per se, uh, description of the the uh, the vehicle or offer a vehicle and, and call it into the OPP. Other questions? Resolution. Be it resolved that council receives the attached draft bylaw short titled off-road vehicle bylaw for review and passage at this meeting as submitted by the bylaw officer. Someone move. Councilor McKenzie, second. Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? Carrie, thank you. You're Thanks, Kristen. You're welcome. Uh, fire, Chris. Good morning, Mayor Burton, members of council. Um, before you is the monthly operations report. And similar to bylaw, we continue to see an increased number of calls for service and complaints with uh, 40 calls for September and 254 calls to date, which are both on the high end of our normal. That's four calls for stations one and six, 19 calls for two and four, and 17 for station three. Below that in the report is the breakdown of the calls by type. That is it for that report, unless there's any questions. Uh, question cease. Chris, I, I'm going to assume that that large number now in 2020 is related to the uh, number of uh, seasonal people that are coming up here as opposed to having nowhere else to go. Um, do you foresee that carrying on into the fall? And if so, are we going to be properly equipped to handle it? Yeah, I believe it's probably going to continue. Um, the types of calls we're getting, though, isn't necessarily it, it, what are, where I see the increases in the authorized burning or the open air burning. So people are being confused with all the rain and the cold temperatures, thinking that the summer regulations have ended and just burning without looking into the bylaws themselves or the, the regulations. So um, we haven't had an increased number of structure fires or an increased number of bad accidents. It, it's kind of across the board. Um, the numbers are slightly higher in the other calls. The burning control basically means campfire complaints that somebody starts burning before seven. Everything else seems to be on board with what we've seen in the past. The questions? Resolution. The council receives a monthly report for the fire department as information only is submitted by the fire chief. Someone move. Uh, Councillor Strong, second. Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Uh, Parks, Recreation, Jim's uh, way, I believe, Shannon. Yes, uh, Jim has his report for council, and uh, I guess I should. And uh, it, he has been continuing, the department has been continuing on with prepping for uh, winter, looking at uh, cleaning up parks, cemeteries, uh, and uh, taking, arranging for the dock removals. And we've uh, replaced the furnace at the arena, which was part of our scheduled capital uh, for this current year. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Assis? The, uh, the, the new uh, trail that we put in between the end of Lakeshore and Parkland, 
Are we going to be opening that to snowmobile traffic this winter? Uh, through conversations with the road superintendent and uh, and Jim and myself, it was felt due to the fact that it was newly created and pretty muddy that we wanted it closed until we get, it froze up and we had snow. And at that point, it would be opened up. The only reason I'm asking is because I went up there and all the fencing and all that stuff has now been obviously ridden over. Uh, it's, it's actually collapsed on the ground and there's a lot of, uh, some of the signage has is, is got some pretty sharp uh, stakes and stuff that are now sticking up out of the ground. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, could we not have that removed at some point in time before it freezes so that it doesn't become an issue for safety uh, if we are going to have snowmobiles on there this winter? <clears throat> yes, it's definitely something that staff can look into. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you. Other questions? Resolution? The council receives a monthly report as submitted by the property supervisor for information purposes only. Someone move. Councillor Strong, second. Councillor McKenzie. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks. Roads, Earl. Good to go. Okay. Morning, Council. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so in our my report there, you see, uh, um, are we? I finished our winter sand. Uh, we did that in record time this year. Uh, it only took us four days. Um, next thing is this: as of this morning, we we're starting to ditch with a grade all uh, on the uh, paved paved roads, eh, where it needs it, and we have uh, McCall's Road to shoulder. And apart from that, why we'll be uh, replacing some culverts. Thirdly, is the uh, restoration of the Glamour, Glamour Lake Park there. Um, I would say we have that probably about half done now. Um, so we're just waiting for the uh, steps to be cut or made. And then uh, probably get at that toward the end of this week. Um, the other thing is, is uh, Inlet Bay Bridge. Um, we did have a beaver dam in it. Uh, we've let the beaver dam out and I was under there and uh, I had some concerns with the abutments. Uh, so I've requested for uh, an engineer to assess for his assessment. Um, and he has now looked at it. We're just waiting for him to come back uh, with the report to us. And the last thing is, is um, department staffing, we have uh, advertised for in the newspapers and the media for uh, an operator and uh, the, con the interviews were conducted and uh, the newly hired employees to start uh, on October 19th. And that's about all I have. Okay. Questions? Cam? I, I was up to the, the Bycroft uh, on the weekend. There are traffic cones there now on the bridge on the downstream side. Is that where the problem is uh, on the lower side? Or That's potential right. problem, I should say. That's right. It's on, on the downside. Um, what the engineer said, he said there are no problems there, but he just recommended we put the cones there for now. Um, okay. We did have a lot of water up there for a while. And, uh, yes, it was. It was definitely. That. Hopefully what you've done works. Yeah. Well, I think it will. <laughs> we hope it. I certainly hope it will. We, uh, what we've done is to stop them, we put two two gates across the end of the bridge there. Now, so keep, try and keep the beaver out. Yeah. <laughs> are, uh, unfortunately, they are building now uh, above the gate. So, uh, yeah. It, uh, that's what beaver do. Yeah, 
Yeah. Well, we're going to clean that out probably tomorrow again, Cam. Recommendation? The council receives a monthly report as submitted by the road superintendent as information only. Someone move. Councilor McKenzie, second. Uh, Councilor Strong. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. <laughs> Committees. Joanne. Shannon. Yeah. I'll be looking after Joanne's report today, so I'm just going to share my screen here. So we continue with the uh, doing similar things as we have in the past few months with through COVID. Uh, Joanne has been uh, doing waivers online. We've received 123 signed waivers for mineral collecting. Uh, for trail counter uh, regular maintenance has been continuing. And uh, she said the homesteader counter appears to be malfunctioning as it uh, reported 12,000 plus counts per day starting on September 5th. So uh, she'll be looking into that. <laughs> the counter data collected uh, shows uh, the numbers as requested by council. Uh, geocaching continues to uh, be very busy, and uh, one of the suggestions that Joanne came up with, they were going to get t-shirts to sell, however, uh, they made arrangements for to have a puzzle, jigsaw puzzle created, uh, and it was done locally. It was manufactured in Halliburton County, and it will be sold at the local uh, retailers. And so we feel that this will be pretty successful. So that is the economic development report. Questions? Please. You're muted. You're muted. Back on again. Um, yeah. Was talking about the numbers that we were getting from the trail counters. Um, do we know uh, how much more we had this year than we had last year, or or did it trend out? Because it, we seem to have had a lot more people up here. I was wondering how many of them were taking advantage of our trails. Jen? To be able to obtain that information, I'll have to have the conversation with the economic development coordinator to provide that data if available. Okay. It was, I don't need exact numbers. It was just to see if, if COVID did have it. And will it apply to next year? Will, will we have another growth next year? Is kind of projecting where we need to be, I guess. Okay. Okay. Resolution. The council is the September 2020 report is submitted by the economic development coordinators information only. Someone move. Councilor McKenzie, second. Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? It's carried. Okay, we're down to finance approval of the accounts recommendation that the general accounts for the month of September 2020 in the amount of $997,178.02 be approved. Someone move. Uh, uh, Councillor Strong, second. Councillor McKenzie. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, procurement policy report, Shannon. So uh, Brittany has provided a detailed report for council. This was presented to council at the previous meeting on September 22nd. It is very detailed. Uh, we have uh, not received comments uh, from, we've received comments from council and there have been no concerns from staff presented. And so we're recommending that the procurement policy be passed as submitted. Um, I'm going to ask now, are there any questions? Cease? You're muted again. The only 
question, the only question that I had was what we were talking about in 702, 7.02, .02, we were talking about uh, local purchases and so on. And um, I understand very, very clearly that we can't be prejudicious on where we buy from. But if all things are equal, and that's what it basically says, uh, we would buy locally or manufactured locally. Is there a tolerance on that in any way, shape, or form? Let's say for the sake of argument that I can buy something from Toronto and it costs $1,000, and I can get the same unit in Highlands East for $1,001. Would I have to buy it from Toronto? Sure. If we're following what our policy states, it says if it's equal, it's black and white. So, so if we it's a thousand and a thousand, then it would be go to local. But if it's a thousand and one, then it doesn't meet the 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 go to procurement policy. Something in my mind isn't quite right with that, even though uh, there is a reality there. Um, is there any way, shape, or form that within a reasonable tolerance? And like I said, I used an extreme. I could have made that ten thousand dollars and ten thousand and one dollar, and it would have been the same answer. Uh, to me, that that's really uh, taking something in a slightly wrong direction, uh, because we are going to be giving up uh, s some of the stuff that uh, that keeps our people busy too, and the differential in 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 the uh, the pricing is, is, is totally and absolutely irrelevant when you look at our budget. I'm, I'm just concerned there. I, I just realize that literal is literal, but uh, not comfortable with the way that could turn out. Shannon? Well, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, uh, with bylaws, we have to, they're detailed. They, the, it's written down, it's black and white. These are the rules we are to follow, but it also states throughout the procurement, there's many other factors that come into play when rating a, um, a procurement. And some of the, and that is determined prior to obtaining, obtaining the, the prices. So there's other factors that come into play when uh, doing approvals. So if the prices were equal, and, and, and you're jogging my memory, and thank you for doing that. Um, there is kind of like a, a, a checklist that has to be completed when you're buying something that states this, 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 and all things being equal, and price is only one of them, and the others are there as well. Is it possible that with the criteria being uh, favoring a local per uh, manufacturer or supplier, but the pricing being slightly higher, that the project could still go to a Canadian, to a Canadian, to a uh, Highlands East uh, supplier, uh, and not just only on pricing. Shannon, yes. so we must we have to follow the discriminatory business practice act. And by doing so, that's why the criteria for rating is created prior to obtaining uh, prices through a tender or request for a proposal. And that way, uh, so the answer to your question is if two proposals were received and for through that rating criteria, the local may have the higher price but had higher um, points in other areas could definitely be the successful proponent. But that, that, that was my big concern is that we're not just going to be going cherry picking strictly for price and, and that we were not looking at the other impact of what could happen from, from a, uh, a uh, purchase being made locally because of what qualities, serviceability, employment, those kind of things that are important to all of us. So um, thank you for that. You're welcome. Any recommendation? The council receives a report procurement policy as submitted by the deputy CAO treasurer and further that no further revisions or recommendations are required to the policy and that passage of the policy and bylaw take place at this meeting. Someone move. Councillor McKenzie, second Councillor Strong. All in favor? 
Ms. Carey, thank you. Uh, administration monthly report, Shannon. Okay, before you is the CAO monthly report. And this report is trying to provide to council with a, 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 a report that shows all of the activities that are transpiring that maybe some of the department heads have been unable to uh, provide council an update on. One of the uh, largest things that I've been dealing with in, in uh, the administrative office is COVID. Uh, we've been really busy changing our, through the EOC going from recovery to back to uh, pre-planning for the second wave of COVID. Uh, we've been able to implement quite a few uh, sick policies or a sick policy. Uh, we've been able to uh, update our business continuity plans and the, we are doing everything in our power to ensure that we maintain a business continuity. <clears throat> Some of the other highlights uh, with the new increasing numbers is the fact that uh, we are now going to be meeting on a weekly basis. Uh, the EOC has recommended that all of the community centers remain closed. Uh, the curling club has determined that they will not be opening this year. And the EOC is currently discussing the possibilities of not opening the arena as previously discussed. And that will um, be determined as uh, we seek updates from the province on COVID-19. Uh, the other item is another large uh, uh, item on our work plate is uh, the fact that we've been having regular meetings with Strategy Corp webinars on 11 different areas. Uh, we've, I've been involved in multiple workshops in this area and reviewing uh, um, different reports and it continues. Uh, Strategy Corp is currently working on their final report to present to the steering committee. Uh, recently, we have advertised and filled a full-time equipment operator vac vacancy, Jonathan, Jonathan Lynch. He starts on October 19th. We are currently advertising for an environmental supervisor due to a resignation, and that closes on October 19th. And in the month of October, we'll be recruiting for a deputy treasurer due to a maternity leave. And uh, so uh, Human Resources Department is very active right now. We've received our final engineering drawings for Hurley Park, and we're waiting for the county uh, to lay out the parking lot. So hopefully to have that completed before snow flies. Um, the municipal class assessments are currently being worked on for South Wilbur Forest Bridge uh, until that is completed and a report presented to council. Uh, we're, we're unable to schedule a public information meeting, uh, so that will be coming before council hopefully soon. And every department you've seen today through some of the monthly reports due to uh, we're saying we think it's COVID-19 related is that every department has seen increased statistics uh, this past year. And so we have more planning applications. We have more septic uh, permits. Uh, we're seeing more uh, statistics in bylaw department. And so it, is, it has been very busy. And I provided you with just a list of some of the activities that are currently going on. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Resolution. The council receives the CAO monthly report submitted by the CAO treasurer for information only. Someone move. <coughs> Councilor Strong, second by Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. Okay, planning, Robin. 
Yes, good morning, Council. Um, before you, we have a shoreline road allowance application. Um, it is, uh, the applicant is Therese and David uh, Giashi, and we received that application on September 14th, 2020. Um, these lands are uh, actually sitting at the mouth of the Wilbermere Lake. They are on Burnt River. Um, and council has made a practice of not selling the shoreline road allowances that are adjacent to the Burnt or the Irondale River. However, as mentioned, the lands are right at the mouth. So this is why it's before council. Um, our bylaw enforcement officer, Wayne Galloway, has performed the site visit and has researched the property file. Um, and on completion, um, Mr. Galloway has stated that the application may move forward to be considered by council at this time. Uh, the lands are at concession 12, lot 33, Wilber Wilberforce Lake, 1077 Saunders Road, Highlands East County of Halliburton, roll 4601 and That is my report. Um, I do know there uh, was a map involved in the agenda for council to have that view of exactly where the property is. So as council can see, it is like right at the mouth there um, of the lake. Okay. <laughs> so would you say by law was out? Uh, no, this is just to whether council wishes to declare the application complete. There is a couple of options in the recommendation. Um, the first being to declare it complete and to um, approve in principle reporting to our municipal solicitor. Or secondly, the council denies the purchase of the shoreline road allowance. Right. So. Ultimately, it comes down to whether... Um, because of the location of the property, if council is wanting to um, approve in principle at this time. Council, comments? I, um, I am going to ask that this is deferred. Um, if it's all right with council, I got to get some more information gathered about this. Uh, council? Would it be all right if we can? You're muted. Tricky thing. I'm in agreement with you, Mayor Burton. Okay. Uh, um, anyone else? No so problem deferring. Can you um, get a resolution ready? Uh, yes, actually, uh, just would need a mover and seconder um, for a motion to defer. Ken? Oh, I'm, uh, I thought we were uh, doing- Okay, uh, a move, mover? That would be me. Cam, second, cease. Okay. Okay. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Okay, um, B? Mm. Robin? Um, yes, um, before you, we do have, again, another shoreline road allowance. Um, this is pertaining to um, Richard Durbecker. Our municipal solicitor on two occasions has forwarded uh, correspondence to the adjacent landowner. And um, our solicitor has yet to hear back anything from the adjacent landowners. Um, he also has stated that there, there is no other reason other than they have not responded. Um, this application came to us or came before council on September 10th, 2019. Council at that time did approve the purchase of the shoreline uh, to be approved in principle and forwarded on. And uh, so Bishop and Rogers being the solicitor has done their due diligence um, contacting all third parties that had to be contacted 
and um, the approval of the uh, adjacent landowner if they don't own their shoreline is not a mandated requirement. However, council has made it um, part of the policy. And um, we have in other instances brought forward uh, to waive the neighbor's authorization when uh, we have not heard from them or uh, they just wish not to, to sign anything, not really having any reason, they just don't want to uh, authorize. And the neighbors would be Dell and Hutton uh, to the west of the applicant. Okay. Any questions? Resolution. The council receives a report shoreline purchase waiver of adjacent landowner authorization to Decker from the clerk, and that council approve waiving the requirement of receiving adjacent landowner authorization for Durbecker's proposed purchase of the shoreline. And furthermore, that council direct staff to advise Bishop and Rogers to proceed in finalizing the purchase. Someone move. Deputy Mayor Ryle, second by Councillor Strong. All in favor? Opposed, carry, thank you. Um, I can see, is that done, but uh, yes, Council, before you, we do have a shoreline road closure bylaw applicant, and it would be Sean uh, Donovan. Uh, the, this application came before um, the municipality on August 23rd, 2019, to purchase at the regular meeting of Council on September 10th, 2019. Uh, council did approve in principle for the application to be uh, sent on to Bishop and Rogers and the solicitor has went through the process um, for public approval and uh, contacting um, the third parties. There were no issues. The applicant is in the process of a rezoning uh, that is also on today's agenda. This requirement was set out in the bylaw enforcement officer's report. The final stage of the process is the consideration for the approval of the bylaw and it is for lands in front of concession 16, part lot 24, 25, plan 409, Essen Lake, County of Halliburton, 4601-602-0030000. Okay, any questions? Resolution. The council receives this report, Shoreline Road Allowance Closure Bylaw to stop up, close and convey as submitted by the clerk for information. And furthermore, the council accepts the recommendations in this report and that bylaw to stop up, close and convey the original Shore Road Allowance be enacted at this meeting for applicant Sean Donovan, concession 16, part lot 2425, plan 409, lot 25, Essent Lake, Highlands East County of Halliburton, rolls 4601-602-000, and 30,000. Someone move. Councillor Strong, second. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? Opposed, carried, thank you. Item D, uh, application real. Uh, I guess, Chris, are you gonna take this? Yep, your worship and council, you can hear me? Yes. And the host has asked me to start my video. Stand by. Um, okay, a couple of complete application reports. Uh, and um, as Shannon mentioned earlier, it has been a uh, uh, busy year and uh, it's not, not just Highlands East, all all municipalities have been dealing with heightened uh, requests for anything to do with, with planning, regulation, zoning, severances. Um, but anyway, we are, um, we are keeping up. And so this applicant uh, name is Riel, uh, part lot 10, concession seven, former Glamorgan, located at 9281 Highway 502. Um, 
And these folks have a lot, just over three and a half acres, with just over 400 feet of frontage. And what they're looking to do is, um, they are in the rural zone, so they are not encumbered necessarily by uh, uh, the floor area maximum for a garage, uh, which only applies in the in the shoreline areas. Um, but they uh, they would like to add a second second floor mezzanine, uh, and so the uh, the maximum height is a constraint for them. So the nature of the uh, the zoning amendment then would uh, allow the construction of a of the two bay garage, just over a thousand square feet with a 500 square foot upper floor mezzanine. And uh, uh, they would require a max height instead of five and a half meters, they would have to go up to seven and a half meters. Um, and so I, I've been on site and, and if you've been along that stretch of 502, you're likely familiar with the property. Um, the county will likely, um, because it is, uh, county road, they'll likely want to be aware of it. But uh, again, it's the, the bylaw can ultimately um, address issues of commercial use uh, as, as well as habitable space. So certainly regulations can be established to ensure that the nature of the building isn't to be used uh, only in an accessory manner to the residential use. Um, so that's my summary and, uh, and we could schedule that for a public meeting in November. Thanks, Chris. Uh, any questions for Chris? Resolution? The council <coughs> declares the rezoning application complete for Dana and Darlene Rio and to proceed with scheduling a public meeting. Someone move. Councilor McKenzie, second by Councilor Strong. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Item E, uh, application, uh, Laura Winfield Bourne, James Bourne, Valerie Hoover, and Lee Winfield. Right, so um, this the second report that's on the agenda today, uh, the applicant's Winfield, part lot 19, concession 9, former Cardiff, and their lot is on um, Potash Lake. Uh, and what these folks are looking to do is to construct an addition onto the existing dwelling, um, and it'd be a... a I believe it's an addition to a bedroom um, of 260 square feet, as well as an attached deck with a floor area of um, 440 square feet. Um, I, I have been on site and um, the, uh, uh, this, this particular, it's a large property, but the, uh, it, the location of the cottage is essentially perched in a, um, sort of a high point of land uh, before it uh, sort of descends down to the shoreline. Um, so the, the areas that they proposed to extend the cottage for the habitable purposes, as well as the deck, I think are, are, are reasonable and appropriate. Um, I have indicated in my report that uh, this, this particular part of the municipality is subject to Crow Valley Conservation Authority regulation. Um, my understanding is the applicants have submitted their uh, their permit application. Um, uh, again, they're, they're a long way from shore, but they are in the 20 meter shoreline setback. The, uh, the, uh, the setback of the deck would be about 52 feet. Um, anyway, notwithstanding, I would just, I would just like confirmation, not necessarily in the form of a permit, but at least confirmation that CVCA is, uh, has received their application and is, it's in process before we schedule the public meeting. And um, if we have not communicated with the CBCA, then we will do that um, this week, now that this report has gone in the agenda. Any questions? None? There, 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 there. Um, resolution? The council declared the rezoning application for Winfield, Bourne and Hoover complete and schedule a public meeting pending the receipt of positive comments or a permit from the Crow Valley Conservation Authority. Someone move. Councillor McKenzie, second. Councillor Strong. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, public meeting, I think we're just about on time. 
We're just going to wait one minute. Okay. That council come out of the regular meeting of council for the scheduled public planning meeting and it be declared open to discuss the following bylaw amendments made under section 34 of the Planning Act pertaining to applicants Donovan and St. Marie. We have someone move. Councillor Strong, second. Councillor McKenzie, all in favor? It's carried. Okay, address. This is a public meeting under section 34 of the Planning Act. The purpose of this meeting is to ensure that sufficient information is made available to enable members of the public to understand the zoning bylaw amendments that are being considered by council. If you wish to be notified of council's decision regarding the rezonings being addressed today, then please ensure you notify the clerk. The parcel of land is located at concession 16, part lot 2425, plan 409, lot 25, 1693 Sunset Cottage Drive, pertaining to Sean Donovan. At the time of this meeting, there has been zero responses pertaining to the Donovan application. At this time, I would ask municipal planner Chris Jones to speak to the rezoning for Donovan. Chris. Yeah, so your worship and council, this is, uh, this is further to the, uh, my, my memo of September 15th. Uh, again, applicant Donovan and, and what, essentially what they're looking to do is recognize a couple of existing uh, structures as he is concurrently purchasing the, uh, the shore road allowance. So he's got a, uh, or they have a, uh, a boathouse, which um, is probably a wet boathouse in, in the high water uh, part of the season, um, but is, uh, is is certainly modest in size. And the other structure that's located in the shoreline setback is a uh, an existing guest cabin that's been there for um, a number of years. And you can see that red arrow on the uh, figure two. Um, that structure has already come down because it was in... Uh, uh, a deteriorating state. And so he will be looking for a building permit to replace that structure. Um, and in order to do so, uh, at the time that he acquires the shore road, he will require zoning to confirm that he can obtain a permit. So that's how this all fits together. And uh, I have drafted the, uh, uh, the, the requisite zoning amendment to, uh, to recognize that existing boathouse as well as the guest cabin. Um, I believe, and if it's not in this report, in, in my uh, in my um, verbal memo last month, uh, it, it it is a fairly large lot. It'd be nice if that if that bunky could go back, perhaps in line or behind the cottage. Um, but again, this is this is a situation where you're dealing with um, a pretty extreme elevation um, from their parking area, which you can see labeled on Figure Two as the as the driveway. Um, down to the cottage and then down even further to the uh, uh, to the boathouse and shoreline area. So it's it's not again because of the topography and elevation doesn't necessarily lend itself to a um, you know a, a new construction site without some level of, of alteration. Um, so that like I say that structure it's it's evident it has been there a long long time, and so all the bylaw would do is recognize that. Uh, and size and location. Um, <clears throat> Council, at this time, Mr. Donovan is not taking part um, in the meeting. He is listening, however. And um, also at this time, there are no other persons wishing to speak to the Donovan rezoning. So does Council have any questions on the proposed bylaw? Council? No. Council will consider all information before them regarding the proposed bylaw. Okay, um, our second applicant is St. Marie. Uh, this parcel of land is located at Concession 6, Part Law 25, RP19R6115, Parts 4 to 7, 
part eight, 1026 Elaine's Lane. There has been one response pertaining to the St. Marie application received from Tim James. At this time, I would ask municipal planner, Chris Jones, to speak to the rezoning for St. Marie. Uh, so your worship yes. council, um, the, uh, again, this, this is also further to uh, uh, my memo of uh, at the last September council meeting. Um, uh, part lot 25 concession six applicant name is is St. Marie um, located at 1026 Eileen's Lake on Gooderham or Pine Lake. Um, and so the uh, the nature of the of the request is to expand the existing uh, shoreline dwelling. Um, it's a the existing dwelling is a two story structure with a partial second floor. So um, existing structure is just shy of 2000 square feet and the proposed um, uh, the proposed addition um, which would go to sort of the northwest um, of, of the building um, is just over a thousand square feet so so mm -hmm. all in a total a total um, floor area of both stories would be just shy of 3,000 square feet or 270.8 square meters. Um, the, you know, like a lot of our lots out there, this one is, is large in area, but it's, it's challenging it just in terms of the irregular shoreline. Um, and so the, uh, sorry. Yeah, so the, um, as, as opposed to the addition sort of being a lateral expansion across sort of the, the, uh, the shoreline it, <clears throat> or, the, or the sort of the primary or prominent lake facing shoreline, this is, a, this is an addition that is going back. Um, again, because of the nature of the lot, which is, it's almost like it's sort of C-shaped. So there's a little inlet or a sort of a wetland bay area. Um, and, and because of that, the, uh, you know, even the addition itself doesn't necessarily get a lot further away uh, from the shoreline per se, except again, uh, if you, to be on the lot, you, you sort of associate with the more prominent lake facing um, part of the shoreline or the vista. Uh, and this, uh, this addition will be uh, heading uh, away from that. Um, and so that's, that's the summary. I have read Mr. James, Dr. Timothy James. So I uh, understand he is a, is a cottager or resident on Gooderham. Um, and he has, uh, he's certainly put together some, some thoughts uh, that um, I, and to a large extent, I concur and agree with as far as um, development impacts and trying to manage development uh, on our lake areas to the benefit of, uh, of water uh, quality. Um, again, in this, in this particular situation, um, again, we are dealing with a, ch a challenging lot and, uh, and the nature of the build or the, uh, or the addition is, is again, away from the sort of the prominent um, lake facing area. Um, the, you know, the only other, uh, the only other comment I'll make and and it's not just this application, it's, it's any application is, um, and council's aware of this, that I, to some extent, I recommend through the planning process uh, um, where, where people are looking for additions or replacement dwellings in the Shoreline setback. I do try to find um, um, uh, give and take or concessions, if you will. Um, and, and this one, to some extent, would be an example. It's... Uh, Again, we the, the zoning bylaw allows 10% lot coverage, and essentially what I've done through the bylaw that is appended for council's consideration is is capped the uh, the total floor area as well as all buildings that's attached to decks and the garage, so that um, uh, if this approval is granted and this addition is built, that would essentially, uh, as far as the zoning bylaw goes, that would that would represent. Uh, sort of the max build out for this lot. So there would be no other as of right uh, development permissions. And that's, that's not an uncommon um, uh, recommendation that I have in, in preparing these bylaws. So 
that's my summary, uh, Your Worship and Council, and um, and I carry on with the public meeting, please. Council, at this time, we do have applicant Morgan St. Marie participating, as well as his agent, Rob Camo. Um, at this time, I would ask uh, Mr. St. Marie, if you have some things to address Council on, please go ahead. Good morning, it's Morgan. I, uh, I don't have any additional comments to add at this point. Thank you. Um, your agent, Mr. Rob Como, do you have anything to address council on? I do not have anything else as well. Uh, I think Chris, uh, Chris kind of covered everything pretty well himself. So, yeah. Thank you. Council, at this time, there are no other persons taking part in the meeting. Uh, wishing to speak to the St. Marie rezoning. At this time, does any member of council have any questions on the proposed bylaw? No? no. Council will consider all information before them regarding the proposed bylaw. At this time, the recommendation that council adjourn the public planning meeting at 10.41 a.m. and that council reconvene to the regular meeting of council. Someone move. Councillor Strong, second by Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Uh, resolutions from other municipalities. The council receives and files the correspondence from other municipalities from the regular meeting of council of October 13, 2020. Someone move? Uh, Deputy Mayor Ryle, second by uh, Councillor Strong. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, correspondence? The Council receives and files the correspondence of the October 13, 2020 regular meeting of Council. Someone move? Uh, Councillor McKenzie, second by Councillor Strong. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, bylaws. Deputy Mayor. Yes, sorry. Go um, ahead. I was just going to ask on, on resolutions. There was one 9.2, uh, which was related to long term care. Um, I was just wondering if, uh, if other members of council might think that would be something we could support. I don't have any problem if, uh, if council would like to support it. We'll uh, get it on the floor. It's uh, Township of North Glengarry funding for long-term care homes. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that we uh, we, we really are, are, are hurting for up here and uh, support would not be a bad thing. Okay. You can just read, read it out. Yes. The council supports the township of North Glen Gary with respect to um, provide funding to increase full time positions in place of casual and part time labor in long term care homes and request that the ministry long term care acts to regularly inspect all long term care homes and sound infection control measures are put in place at all Ontario long term care homes and that this resolution be forwarded to Premier. Ford, the Ministry of Long-Term Care, Mary Lee Fullerton, and all Ontario municipalities for consideration. Someone move. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ryle, second. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, all in favor? It's carried, thank you. Okay, I guess back to you. Yes, Council, before you, we have uh, several bylaws. Uh, the first one being bylaw number 2020-64. And this is for applicant Sean Donovan with regards to a shoreline purchase. Recommendation that bylaw number 2020-64 being a bylaw to purchase the shoreline road allowance by Sean Donovan be enacted, approved, and signed with the corporate seal attached at this October 13, 2020 meeting. Have someone move. 
Councillor Councillor Strong, second by Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? It's carried. Okay. Uh, second bylaw number 2020-65, rezoning for Sean Donovan. Recommendation being that bylaw number 2020-65 being a bylaw to rezone lands for Sean Donovan be enacted, approved, and signed with the corporate seal attached at this October 13, 2020 meeting. Someone move. Uh, Councillor Strong, second. Councillor McKenzie. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, next bylaw, uh, rezoning for St. Marie. Recommendation that bylaw number 2020 66, being a bylaw to rezone lands for Morgan St. Marie, be enacted, approved, and signed with the corporate seal attached at this October 13, 2020 meeting. Someone move. Uh, Councillor Strong, second. Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? It's carried, thank you. Our next bylaw is pertaining to off-road vehicles. Recommendation that bylaw number 2020-67 being a bylaw to be, to be a bylaw to permit off-road vehicles on municipal highways within the municipality of Highlands East be enacted, approved and signed with the corporate seal attached. Someone move. Councillor McKenzie, second. Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Our next bylaw is per pertaining to the procurement policy. Uh, that bylaw number 2020 68 being a bylaw with policy for the purchasing of goods and services by the municipality of Highlands East operations be enacted, approved, and signed with the corporate seal attached. Someone move. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, second. Councillor Strong, all in favor? It's carried, thank you. Uh, yes, this final bylaw council pertains to Bill and Shirley Lingard. Um, they did have a previous rezoning bylaw that went forward. Um, that is going to be repealed as changes need to be uh, made to it. You did get it circulated to you as I did not have it at the time the agenda was published. Um, so council, um, I'm sure you've had time to review it. Um, we also have our municipal planner who, um, if on the line could speak again to the changes of the bylaw. Chris. Thank you, Scott. Is on? Sorry, that is uh, my error. He has been removed off of the panel. Okay, well, that's fine. I have enough information. Okay. Recommendation that bylaw number 2020-69 being a bylaw to revise the rezoning of lands for Lingard, Bill and Shirley, be enacted, approved and signed with the corporate seal attached. Someone move. Councillor Strong, second. Councillor McKenzie, all in favor? It's carried. Okay, no notice of motion. Confirmation bylaw. That bylaw number 2020-70 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council at its meeting of October 13th, 2020 be enacted, approved and signed with the corporate seal attached. Someone please move. Uh, Councilor McKenzie, second by Councilor Strong. All in favor? It's carried. Adjournment. That the regular meeting of council for October 13, 2020 be adjourned at 1049 a.m. Someone move. Councillor Strong, second. Deputy Mayor Ryle. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you, council. Thank you, staff. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.